perception of Ginsburg in terms of his questions coming in. Uh, translation has been talked about very objectively, uh, almost like with the invisible hand. And I've really heard him speak directly to the role of the translator, mediator, narrator, author. What role, as you go, you know, you all articulate different aspects of translation, but no one is really talking about the political stance of the person doing the translating. Would, uh, well, Herman, very, like very, uh, it's a very important point. It's actually a, a big issue in comparative literature as well in tra as in translation studies. And the person sitting to your right <laughs> is someone who's, who's written a, a big book, uh, The Subversive Scribe, about that. So the, the political position in this case, gender related but not only, um, has an enormous effect on translation. So as we consider translations, uh, the complexity grows but in, in important ways, because that's how we have to think about what we're reading. So I think it's a very important point. And I think there's more and more being written on it. I believe there is a book, is Esther Allen's book going to relate to this? But the question of what is the translator even thinking when she is translating, he is translating, which doesn't, of course, give us a full picture in any way of their political involvement. But that, for instance, is very interesting. And then to think about the situation in which the text is created mm -hmm. and what effects this might have had on the, on the translator. And Edwin will have a lot to say about this, the question of power in, in issues of translation. Mona Baker has written about this, um, the whole question of power and the translator. Political views is one of the most, I'd say, active issues or most salient ones now in comparative literature and translation studies. Something that needs to be said, since I, uh, I edit a series for Palgrave on translation, the translators are paid in a way which is really not too good. They are mm. seen, whatever we theorize, they are not seen, I don't know about Bible translation, but they are seen as like secondary workers, you know, paid even mm. good payment is by so many pages. It's a totally statisticalized, arithmeticalized. Mm. I wasn't paid to translate the Lagamatology. Why? Because mm. I was an academic. But translators mm. are really paid miserably. And I think I have much to say about the role of the translator, but I should let others speak. But this should be mentioned if you're asking that, asking this, and sentence. Of course, the translator's role depends on the system within which, for what purpose, there, there is no such thing as an abstract translator. The love question comes in even within what is most translated today, which is do-it-yourself uh, things, instructions for things made in China and so on, right? And you have to love in that, I'm not talking about a phenomenal affect when I use the word love. I'm talking about a strange kind of relationship. Those translations, it's a huge industry. People translate it into the language, English, Arabic, parara, as you see in the thing. And then people who read English, Arabic, etc., translate it back into the original to see if the translations are real or not. This industry is completely huge and at work, and that's even bigger than truth commissions and so on and so forth. And even there, I bring in that word love, and I stop here. Don't make a note. Well, I was just to follow up on what Gayatri said, which again relates to gender and the overarching role that gender plays. I mean, the translator has traditionally been Genderized. Books like Translators Through History, published in many languages. A History of Spain is called Translators and Intercultures, the people working within intercultures. Some years ago, Andrew Chessman wrote a paper, The Name and Nature of Translator Studies, <laughs> parodying or uh, working from James Holmes as The Name and Nature of Translation Studies. Um, in the last five years, we've been turning our attention in Europe to the sociologies of translation, applying sociologies, investigating who translators are, not in abstract terms, but in quite empirical sociological terms. 
um, with some results that, that would not be surprising to you, such as, for example, all translators also have other jobs, <laughs> unless otherwise noted. Right. And, and a lot can be gained through seeing there are other forms of activity and usually other forms of mediation. In parallel to that, I think the last seven or eight years in Europe have been marked by process studies, by a lot of empirical data on what actually happens, gained through think aloud protocols, eye tracking, um, and, and basic screen recording, uh, what's actually going on in the translator's cognitive processes, this connects with cognitive science, <coughs> and, and one of the challenges we have now is to connect the sociological with the cognitive. But yeah. the place is the translator, not the text. All translators have other jobs except wives in badly gendered. I know at least <laughs> 50, 100 wives who translate on the side uh, as they live in a completely gendered situation. Srijata Guho is at the moment translating for me for the series. You know, she does it because she's a wife. So you should take them in. <laughs> wife is a job? I don't know. Okay, I'm not going to do that. No, I, I stand corrected. Wife is a job. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you for all of you for very interesting uh, uh, papers. I was, uh, we have been discussing the inculturation uh, concept of uh, Anthony, and I was wanted still to have an, uh, another answer, uh, question uh, about it because it seems to me that uh, you speak about uh, inculturation when you speak. Uh, from the kind of source perspective, I am letting my my text being translated into into other, and uh, it's a kind of assimilation. And we, in translation studies, we have been discussed the assimilation the processes of, of the risks uh, of the assimilation processes in translation. I think it should be important to distinguish. First question, could you this, uh, explain the difference, in your opinion, between assimilation and uh, inculturation? And the other thing is that I think it's important to uh, make clear, it's a very uh, clear uh, power question here, the direction of this. Am I deciding that my text is be going to be translated into other cultures, into other languages? Or am I deciding that I will receive into my language the text of the other? I think that that's yeah, it's an important uh, distinction, and it's a power distinction too. At that point, I become very empirical. We decide this through case studies, through investigating what actually happens. I am really not at home in, in generalized abstractions about all translators or all intercultures or all processes. Uh, I find these as models who. Are for exploration. Let's find out. <laughs> can, I, can I raise, uh, I've raised it several times. This is a question for, for, for Edwin and for Siri, I think. Um, the post-translate, I mean, uh, that's an elegant solution. Uh, the, the po we're moving into the post-translation. Therefore, translation is everywhere, under all our feet, all the time. Uh, it's a political gamble. Isn't the risk, in, in pure terms of power and money and students and jobs, isn't the risk that we lose contact with societies that want and realize they have to train translators? That's a that's general sense, narrow sense distinction. But yes, that that's, that's it. I mean, isn't there a risk involved there of saying translation is everywhere, so let's publish and talk about everything, and of dissipation? Can I answer, uh, since I feel it, uh, responsible for this concept, it's, we are not speaking about post-translation, the post-translation studies. Yeah. Right. So and that's is very important. Uh, the introduction to, of yeah. the journal, we, we use uh, this so expression. The, the, the so who, who died there? What happened to translation <laughs> studies? And yes. Like post-modernism, uh, post post <laughs> I mean, nothing is da uh, dead. Uh, we use the concept of, of post, uh, not, not because every it's after something that is dead. It is the idea that we shall go a step further uh, and not being uh, creating a discipline and uh, creating the barriers and the borders around the discipline, 
because we have the idea that we have a consciousness about this discipline now that we didn't have in the beginning of the 80s. We have, and we had to cons construct the discipline. It was very, very important. But now we have to go a step further mm -hmm. and open up and have a, a more dialogue, more contact, more dis uh, discussion, and transdisciplinary dialogue uh, with uh, with uh, other disciplines. That's that's the post uh, post translation studies idea, not post translation. I don't. That doesn't exist in my opinion. I think. I think Professor Berman and then our colleague. I was just going to follow up on this with some very practical experience we've had at Princeton that actually uh, we started a program that talks about translation, a, a kind of translation studies course. And this has made more people aware of translation and more interested in pursuing it eventually at the graduate level because this is an undergraduate program. We don't train them as translators. But I think it might have the effect of making people more aware of where they might stand in translation, in translating, and perhaps eventually create more translators as well as more respect for the work of translation. So, just uh, we have a little colleague data. in the audience, and then Professor Spivak. Translation studies as a field have been created in the last decade, and it's been created as a real, well, as an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. So. I, I don't really see the point of going beyond that because as a field, it already is a dialogue. A, a what? Discipline. Dialogue. dialogue. A dialogue. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is how I'm not sure if it's the, um, the, the question you raised just in a few minutes The transition is in, in, in interdiscipline created the, the scope to create a, a discipline. It's the last discipline of the last century. <laughs> uh, we began at the end of the 19th century with the linguistic sociology, and we, in the end was the transition study, studies, which purpose was to create a discipline, for many reasons. Also for, from, for a, a sociology of academy. Mm? There are many reasons uh, for the creation of transition studies. Of, of course, there is there was a necessity, uh, uh, an inter a, a real interest, but there are also also many uh, other reasons uh, in, in creation of transition studies. And surely, one is uh, like semiotics. Uh, one idea was to create an independent discipline from, for example, from a comparative literature or for a different literatures. So in this sense, yes, uh, it is. Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, there is a, a strong interdisciplinarity in the relation studies, but uh, the, the end was the creation of the discipline. In this sense, uh, I think it's necessary to speak uh, of a post translation studies uh, step uh, in, the, in the sense of the transition studies like a, a, an independent discipline from the other. Which maybe it can be also interdisciplinary, but uh, in any case, is uh, as some roots in the past century. Okay, I just want to say two things. One is that post is a dangerous prefix because <laughs> yeah. it has really received so much, uh, I think, deserved negative criticism. As the inventor of the horrible word post-structuralism, I say that, you know, post, although uh, now, now what I want to ask is, am I right in thinking as I'm thinking, having given the warning about post? Slowly, I mean, Duke even brings out a series called post-contemporary something or other, come on. But uh, post it we call these things. But at any rate, um, you know, there is a lot of stuff about cultural studies. But I very quietly work in cultural politics. And this I learned from my first editor, uh, uh, Bill Germano, who put a, a subtitle to my title, which said Essays in Cultural Politics, and said, yeah, that's what I'm doing, cultural politics. And this makes the cultural studies field as a kind of field workplace. And to an extent, what has happened as translation, preservation, etc., these things are so 
solidifying themselves into these sort of concrete uh, acts uh, organized, etc., they are also becoming sites of fieldwork. And when that happens, because they actually are symptomatic of all kinds of other things, and that's when you, what you're calling post-translation studies begins to come into, I mean, the claims made, the claims not made, the ways people are silenced, the ways people are not silenced, all of these things, the choices. This is a field of, I mean, for me, a field within this cultural politics stuff. And I think that's what uh, brings out this post uh, impulse. But I would, as a, as a sufferer, someone who's been burnt, I would suggest that if slowly, without showing that you're actually finding another word, yeah, yeah. that it can be called <laughs> something else, I think it would probably get better mileage. I have a joke, postmodern, post-structuralism, postmortem. So, uh, there we go, <laughs> there we go, <laughs> yes. Yes, I do think that, that actually um, the journal is going more in the direction you're pointing to, Anthony, and it's dif differentiating the, the translation studies from the translation phenomena, the, the action, the process of translating. That, yeah, can happen anywhere, yeah. Uh, the, translation discipline, the translation studies as a discipline um, Depends on how you see it, but as a, as a lot of people who think abstractly about the act of translating, that was all over the Renaissance, right? They already were doing all of that, and it was at the basis of modernity. Uh, it came hand in hand with the print and with the invention of history and geography as epistemological uh, grounding fields for the Western, uh, you know, he he hegemony in this plant part of it. But. Um, the, the translation studies that they are referring to are the since the cultural studies and all these abstraction of abstraction of abstraction that is you know it's it's self-consuming and elliptical and it's not leading very further and that's I think what they mean by post-translation studies and I also think that it's dealing a little bit of what you were referring to as discipline um, mm -hmm. and the and the concept of disciplining that actually goes. Uh, against the creativity, uh, a, create, a creative process. So I think that, um, yes, we all agree that the post is the worst part of the whole thing, um, but it is a good <coughs> venue for more um, empirical, if you want to use that very good sounding word, but more, more focusing on the, on the phenomenon of translating mm -hmm. that can happen at various levels and at various uh, moments and languages. Um, yeah. Thank you, Victoria. Yes, I've been accused of this before that if we, everything is translation, then we have really nothing to talk about. I mean, <laughs> it, and I guess one person wrote about my book in China is that it's not really about translation at all. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It's a translation in a much, much broader sense than uh, I have seen studied, and. I, uh, unfortunately, our models for translation studies, much of them do derive from Europe, and uh, it certainly translations here, it's, I guess, it's still a sub-discipline of linguistics or comparative literature primarily. There are still mm -hmm. only about a dozen universities that offer a degree. Out of, what, 2,500 universities in America, mm -hmm. there's maybe a dozen places that offer it as a field or as a discipline. Um, and there's only two PhDs in the whole country right now. So um, so we have had to be creative about creating translation studies as uh, a kind of a cultural studies. And people are very good about this. I mean, Professor Berman at uh, Princeton grabs a professor here and grabs a professor there and puts together a, a program. My sort of dream considering that the disciplinarity or even the interdisciplinarity of translation studies does derive from practice. And it's at the translation center where I came educated in translation and knowing a couple of European languages was asked to set up a center to help the people of the state of Massachusetts. And the first language we needed was Spanish and the second was Portuguese, but then we needed Vietnamese, Cambodian, Lao, Haitian, Creole. We needed 
We needed a dozen languages that the universities weren't teaching. I taught Haitian Creole on Sundays afternoons using a textbook that I <coughs> borrowed from one of Aristide's uh, people in exile in Boston because I didn't know there were a dozen different Haitian Creoles at the time, and I didn't know what... Mm -hmm. There was no one to teach it. I don't know Haitian Creole, but I got the textbook and we went through it page by page. And we, but, and then I became I realized that it's translation is really everywhere. It's in the hospitals. It's in the schools. It's in the universities. My daughter teaches third grade in California. I could see the, her Hispanic students counting on her knuckles because that's how you do math in in Mexico. Mm. And you. <laughs> It's all over, it's in the families. Bielobrotsky is here, she's working on intergenerational translation and what a grandmother or a mother says to a daughter or a son in the homes. Uh, what Michael Cronin says that 80% of the core pie of translation studies aren't considered by translation scholars because they're oral, mm -hmm. they're not written. Mm -hmm. I would say that there's another 80% in addition to the 80% that translation mm -hmm. study scholars haven't even looked at because the discipline is created so that it ignores <coughs> the vast majority of translation data that's out there. So I don't know if I'm talking about translation or culture, but I want to get I want to get researchers in the field looking at these places and moments and spaces that really are nowhere in the discipline right now. No I should place. say that in the 60s, I established a translation program as Director of Comparative Literature at the University of Iowa and gave an MA. It was 1966, Daniel Weisbord. Daniel Weisbord. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I take credit here as you're talking about. <laughs> well, I think it's time for another round of applause to thank our panelists and everybody said <laughs> We've got a lot of mile, miles out of you, poor scholars. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Spielach, Professor Pim, Professor Diamond, Professor Gensler. You made this a, a wonderful day of conversation. And uh, a couple of us who, who had the idea, I mentioned this earlier, to create this kind of opportunity, this sort of event, say we go back to discussions that Stefano and I had uh, within the last year, reflecting on the big event and are we able to pull off an international conference? We've tried it successfully. Uh, but when I look at shrinking budgets, that didn't seem the best way to go about it. And yet, um, Anthony, you mentioned one of the things that uh, Eugene Nida did in his time was to create space. And um, who knows what we'll take away from this, but the goal was to uh, continue, I think, that tradition of creating space. The Nida School in Mizano is committed to moving the translation of sacred texts and discourse around that into the middle of this thing called translation studies, which obviously we have not yet quite clearly defined. <laughs> Death of a discipline. Uh, uh, <laughs> but our conviction is that uh, sacred texts uh, are, are an important part of cultures. And um, so I hope today we've at least continued that NIDA tradition of creating space for conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.